Hello and welcome to today's event. My name is Mary Alice McCarthy and I run the Center on Education and Labor here at New America. So today I had the enormous pleasure of welcoming Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and author Farrah Stockman. Farrah is joining us today to talk about her new book, American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. In this book, Farrah tells the story of the closing of the Rexnord Link Belt plant in Indianapolis, where for generations, workers had manufactured world-class ball bearings that were used, as you say in the book, Farrah, in just about every piece of machinery that moves. American Made is a deeply reported account of what happens to workers during and after uh, the closure of a plant, uh, with beautifully written detailed narratives that really bring these workers' experiences to, uh, to life. It also puts these stories into a broader context of political, economic, and social change over the last several decades. That in turn shapes what happens to the individual workers and their different trajectories during and after the plant closing. So with that, let me welcome uh, you, Farah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, just to kick things off, um, can, you tell us, uh, can you tell us what American Made is about and, and what made you want to write this book? Well, first, thanks for having me. It's, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to see workers and working people make it into the national conversation for all kinds of reasons uh, right now. Um, I started thinking about this book on election night in 2016. Uh, I was at Wellesley College and my uh, assignment was to gather string for what we all thought was going to be the historic election of the first female president. And uh, instead, uh, everyone in the place where I was, uh, was shocked to see so many millions of Americans casting a ballot for a man who had never served even one day in office, and they made him president. Uh, I'm from Michigan, I'm from the Rust Belt. Uh, and so I started asking around like, why? Why Donald Trump? What do you see in him? And I kept hearing the same thing uh, from folks in Michigan. He's going to save our job. He's going to bring the factories back. So I decided to follow people at a factory who were watching their job move overseas or move abroad to really find out, like, what does that feel like to be told that your job is going away because these people over here are going to do it cheaper? And at the time, I, during during the campaign, Trump used to have these rallies where he would basically ask workers to call out their years of seniority. And it really, you know, people from Carrier, which was a sister plant to Rexnord, um, would be asked like, okay, anybody here from Carrier? Like how, you know, how many people, uh, how many years did you work there? And he had this real rapport with uh, people in the audience based on factories. And he would say, oh, I'm never going to eat another Oreo because of, you know, the, the company that was making Oreos was moving away. So this was a real theme that um, a lot of people had missed. And uh, I personally hadn't paid enough attention to it. And so this was a chance. And I decided to pick Rexnord because right after the election, he tweeted about it and got into this big uh, spat with their union president, Chuck Jones on Twitter. And it was just fascinating coming out because I was like, how, you know, if he wants to be a champion for workers, why is he getting into this huge public spat with their union president? It just sort of flew in the face of everything I thought I knew about labor and unions and politics. And so I, I really dived in and, and got, a, got an education for sure. Thank you for that. And yeah, that that is wonderful framing. Uh, it's, uh, you know, making sense of the of the 2016 election, I think, for for many in, in Washington and in the media uh, was, you know, an urgent, urgent priority uh, after after the 2016 election. Um, so you chose to do that by following the lives specifically of three workers, uh, John Feltner, Raleigh or Wally Hall Jr. and Shannon Mulcahy, who all worked at Rexnard. Um, why these workers and, and what were you hoping to discover uh, through their specific experiences? Yeah, so um, John is a, a white union vice president um, who I met at the union hall. He was with the first guy I met and this was his second plant closing. So he represented um, kind of an almost militant pro-union uh, stance, somebody who he'd been uh, 
this he was the son of, of a he, he came from a long line of union people. His granddad and grand, great granddad were all mine workers. And so the, this, he, he came like unions ran in his family, um, but he voted for Trump. And so this was really interesting to me. And I knew I wanted to get that perspective because there were a lot of people like that who I'd met who had been lifelong Democrats or their families had been uh, always voted uh, for Democrats and yet they cast ballots for Trump. So what was that? And I wanted to understand that better. Um, there were a lot of black workers at this plant and as, as there are a lot of black workers in factories all over. And so, you know, in the media, we talked about the white working class voting for Trump. Why didn't the black workers vote for Trump? They were working side by side, right? They presumably had the same economic interests. What was it about, um, about the black workers or about Trump that caused them to have a totally different view of, of what was going on? And so I, I really, I met Wally at a union rally where he gave this fiery speech about um, interracial worker solidarity. We got to stand and fight, y'all. And afterwards, there was this long line of of uh, guys in Harley Davidson jackets that were waiting to shake Wally's hand and hug him. And I was at the end of that line, and I said, you know, I want to, I want to hear from you. I want to um, hear more from you. And he, he, he became suddenly the most optimistic person that I had met up till that point. He was the only one who had a plan for what was going to happen after the factory closed. And he said, me personally, I'm going to start a barbecue. And he handed me a card and it was, it was Wally Woodfire's barbecue. He wanted to start his own restaurant, which was a big surprise to me. And so I was like, I want to follow him to see if he actually does it. And Shannon was the last person I found. She was a white single mother who had worked her way up from a, being a janitor to a heat treat operator. She was, um, at the time I met her, it was one of the most highly paid and dangerous positions on the factory floor. She was the first woman ever to have done it. And she overcame huge obstacles to get that job. And it, she just was nothing like the factory worker, the stereotypical factory worker that you think about. She, and so, you know, she was kind of this sort of blue collar feminist. And I really wanted to tell the story of a woman in that plant because the story of blue collar women it rarely makes it into the political conversation. And there was so much assumptions about them and that they would cast ballots for Hillary Clinton and put her over the top. And really, you know, the things that they were thinking about in their everyday reality weren't, um, you know, they had they had a hard time relating to Hillary Clinton, or they had outright hostility to Hillary Clinton because she'd been married to Bill, who had passed NAFTA, and NAFTA was just this recurring theme: hatred for NAFTA, anger, and a feeling of betrayal uh, at at the passage of NAFTA, which was allowing so many of these factory jobs to go to Mexico. So I learned a lot from them, and. I mean, I guess the biggest thing they had in common was that they, they let me follow them around, <laughs> which was not something every factory worker wanted. Um, so uh, there, there was that. <laughs> and, and, and how long did you follow them? It was about two years in total or three years. I mean, I pretty much followed them the entirety of the Trump administration. I started, um, I followed Shannon intensively for seven months in 2017, which is when the factory shut down. And I kept following her and, and I got to know uh, John and Wally much better in, in 2018. And, um, and I, you know, I really followed them until, you know, I turned in a whole copy of the book in, in 2018. And then my, my publisher said, no, you, you know, uh, do a few revisions. And then, and then in 2020 COVID hit. And she said, you got to add COVID. And then it was like, you might as well go until you see who wins the election. And so it, it ended up, it ended up being pretty much the, the whole Trump administration, which was amazing to see how their views change. Usually when you're political, you know, doing a political story, you get a quote here and, you know, it's, it's kind of 
reflective of what the, the reporter already thinks and what polls have already suggested. And so you get this one quote that's hanging there in time. But when you really follow people, you can see how their views change, shift, what, what moves them. And I came to really see Shannon and uh, in particular as sort of a bellwether, a bellwether for American public opinion. Because if she was angry at the administration about something, I knew that uh, Trump would have to backtrack. And if she was, you know, if she was not bothered by Trump, then I knew, okay, this was not going to be, you know, this, this was going to sail through. So um, anyway, that's what I, that's what I came to, to figure out. And so in 2020, when she started souring on Trump, I thought that that was the first glimmer that maybe he wasn't going to win. Yeah. Uh, and I just have to say, um, having read the book, they, they, it's such an intimate portrait and 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 uh it's just wonderful um yeah the, the complexities of the individuals and, and their stories and uh um and and just the i just found myself repeatedly sort of surprised and 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 um you know by by the by the the people's views and, and reactions to things and and, and their resiliency uh, uh was also just always inspiring throughout the book um but yes just such wonderfully com uh, complex and, and richly reported uh individual narratives um the, another thing i really appreciated about the book was how you weave together these very personal stories with a, a you know a really helpful explainer on the history of u.s trade and economic policy and how those policies directly shaped what happened to each of these individuals. So speaking of politics and policy, um, you and I had the opportunity last week uh, uh, to speak with Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio about your book. He's a big fan of the book um, and to talk about his views. And as a, as a senator from Ohio, uh, I, much of it resonated with him very much. So we're going to now run that clip uh, of our conversation there. And then when we're done with that, we'll come back out and be able to catch back up with our with our live conversation. Okay, so now I have the tremendous pleasure of welcoming Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio to the conversation. Senator, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. And I know you've read American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. So I was wondering if we could just get started by having you share with us how you felt about the book, just your general impressions, how it made you feel. Um, I, I feel inadequate for a number of reasons. One, I read the book once, but my wife read the book twice. But um, I, I've gone through it before this interview too, but I I was really taken with what this book does. The few books are written about trade from the workers' perspective in this country. Uh, one of the things that I thought Ms. Stockman said so well, um, and I probably should quote it to get it right, she said um, that that uh, every economist I inter ever interviewed the subject of free trade has assured me it was a boon for the country. And then the next uh, two pages later, she said um, that college educated fared far better on the fact than on, than on others. And I've seen what, I, I, I am a traditional progressive Democrat that has um, fought for workers my whole career. And um, this book really does show how Democrats, how, how the country, presidents of both parties, the business community leading the way, and, and the country as a whole betrayed workers especially in middle America, but really everywhere. It's just they're more concentrated in the state that uh, Ms. Stockland focused on Indiana and my state next door, Ohio. Um, but I also, unfortunately, from my political party's viewpoint and my political ideology viewpoint as a progressive, this book really did show that working Americans, white, I mean, certainly white working Americans, but African Americans feel the same way on this issue felt this betrayal and it felt stronger coming from Democrats because we are the workers party. They expected it from corporate America. They expected it from, from the, the shills, if you will, in Congress that always represent corporate America. Of course, they're gonna be for these trade deals. But what, what President Clinton did and President Obama did, the damage it did to the country, aided and abetted by almost all Republicans and frankly, too many Democrats, the, I think is just so well documented in, in American Made. And I, um, I, I was saying to Ms. Stockler before that I, um, when, I, when I read books, I, one of my favorite quotes from um, a, book, a book called How to Read a Book by, um, uh, 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 by I'm forgetting, the founder of the Aspen Institute. Um, he, said, he, he said, if you, if you want to honor the craft of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the printer, you don't write in books. If you want to honor the craft of the writer, you write in the book. And I, 
obviously wrote a lot of notes in this book because it was so well done. It's it's personal, it's ideological, it's it deep it deals, it, de it de dies into the psyche of workers in a way um, with quotes and stories. And she's a wonderful storyteller and that made the book that much better. Thank you, Senator. That, you just made me feel a lot better about writing in books. So, <laughs> Fair, I wonder if you want to reflect a little bit on, on what the Senator said in terms of what he's hearing from people in Ohio when he talks to his constituents, the sense of betrayal and the sense of frustration. Is that something that tracked with, with what you were hearing in, in Indiana? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the Senator is, is, is a Democrat elected in Ohio today because he never, he didn't vote for NAFTA. He, he was never confused about how the working people felt about it. And um, so to me, it was really eye opening to talk to people. Um, a lot of the steel workers I followed were from diehard union families that had always voted for Democrats. And it was you know, I sat there in the union hall and they told me the day they decided to stop being Democrats. And um, a lot of it had to do with NAFTA and two workers I followed. Um, this was their second plant closing. So their first plant closing was uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And um, that's when they started feeling that the Democratic Party had gotten in bed with corporations. And if you think about how we determine what is US interests when we go and negotiate a trade deal, in the past it has been almost uh, exclusively what is in the interests of American corporations. And labor and environmental standards were just kind of side agreements if they were mentioned at all. Um, so I do think that, uh, you know, there's a hopeful sign to all this. They did renegotiate NAFTA in the last, you know, in recent years. And that has been, um, that was a bipartisan success that we don't talk a lot about. Um, because, you know, Obama promised to do it. And Trump promised to do it. And it finally happened. And this is a finally an agreement that actually has teeth to it and, and the hope of some enforcement. So we'll see. The jury's still out about how it's going to work. But this is what workers were talking about and asking about. And they knew far more about NAFTA than I did. I, I, I would slightly disagree with Ms. Stockman that this bill, this new round is a bipartisan success. Trump, it became that in the end. But Trump put out another NAFTA, just a, uh, a dressed up corporate trade agreement that helps corporations and betrays workers. And it was Ron Wyden and me and um, some people like Catherine Tai working in the House, who now is the Biden trade rep, that said, no, there will be no renegotiated NAFTA, no USMCA, as Trump said, unless you write it, putting workers at the center. And it took us a year to convince the US trade rep that we meant business, we will not have, we will block it in the Senate. I have enough votes with my Democratic colleagues. Um, and it was pretty much all Democrats to block it. In the end, corporate America wanted another trade agreement and they were forced to take language um, that, that finally puts workers in the center. And that what that means in the future is that every trade agreement will have that as, as a minimum, those worker standards to lift up workers in other countries. Because to me, it was never anti-Mexico or anti-China. In fact, it was pro-Mexican. My position was pro-Mexican worker and pro-Chinese worker um, because they're doing better, as Paul Wellstone used to say, when we all do better, we all do better. And if workers in other countries are doing better, it means that that they won't, the companies are much less likely in Youngstown or Dayton or Ms. Stockman in Indianapolis to shut down production there, move overseas, collect the tax break that Trump gave them and that, um, that Bush gave them, collect the tax break, um, undermine worker safety standards and then sell those products back in the United States. All these workers and Ms. Stockman's chapter, chapters on, on workers in Indiana training workers to take their jobs understanding that the, the world dropped out. If, if, if a whole community experiences a plant closing, and I, I grew up in Mansfield, Ohio, we had, we had electrical workers, thousands at Westinghouse, thousands of auto workers at General Motors, thousands of rubber workers at Mansfield Tire, thousands of workers in plant after plus steel workers at Empire Detroit. Um, when those leave, people's lives fall apart. 
they look to blame somebody because somebody should take the responsibility. And even those Republicans did it to them much more aggressively than, than Democrats. They blame Democrats um, in part because we promised something better and we have been the party of workers. Once we overthrew our segregationist FDR days, thankfully, we became the party, unquestionably the party of workers um, and Republicans were party of corporations. They continue to be the party of corporations. We, can, we became too much the party of corporations too. And as Truman used to say, Chet, why does, if you've got two choices, you might as well take the real thing. If they were gonna go with corporate America, they go with corporate America. And that was our, that was our loss and the country's loss as Ms. Stockman pointed out so well. Speaking of biases, sort of built-in biases, but also maybe some some changing conventional wisdom is 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 labor unions. You know, you both mentioned labor unions. You mentioned the steel workers. The Rex Nord plant that you document uh, is a steel worker plant, or was a steel worker plant. Um, and for a long time, I, I it felt like not only were sort of elites sort of you know thinking that plant closures were were inevitable, but also that somehow labor unions had caused them to a certain extent or were part of the problem. And I feel like are we seeing a shift in that opinion as well? And and I guess for both of you, where do you see sort of unions sort of fitting into the people you talk to in terms of how they see them as part of part of you know an important part of the future? And and in particular, Senator, for you, like where where do you see the American labor movement as, as part of sort of recovering from what what has happened to our? You want to start uh, on that, Ms. Stark? Go ahead. Um, I think for a long time unions were in a death spiral. If you you know, even the even the factories that didn't close um, were forced to uh, negotiate away benefits that they had gotten their their members because the threat of closure, the threat of moving, was was so serious. And so um, that's what I saw with the with the union I followed. And by you know, when when every round you're giving up something, you're giving up whether it's wages or or benefits that you had previously fought for, people got cynical and uh, about what the union could do for them. Um, I think now we are seeing a change um, in a, a resurgence of, of faith in unions and um, and what unions could could bring, um, not only in the United States but internationally. I think uh, the Biden White House is putting a lot of energy into trying to make sure that unions in Mexico can um, can fight for workers and that you're you're not going to be fired or killed if you uh, if you join a union uh, in 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 some of these countries that enjoy the benefits of free trade with us. Well, and part, part of that's a big part of our of our renegotiated NAFTA is to empower Mexican trade unions, as, as Ms. Stockman's comment suggested. Um, I, Republicans are as anti-union as they've ever been. Uh, we have uh, the labor movement's number one priority in the Senate, or maybe number, in the top three anyway, is something called protecting the right to organize the PRO Act. 47 out of 50 Democrats are co-sponsored, co-sponsors zero out of 50 Republicans. Uh, Republicans still uh, put them, they put them about in Ohio, which is a swing state that's gotten more and more conservative as I think most of your, your viewers know. Um, back in 2011, the only time an issue like this has actually been on a state ballot, a uh, Republican governor, Republican legislature, Republican businesses were trying to take away collective bargaining rights from public employees in the state. And we beat them almost two to one on a ballot, on a ballot issue. So clearly the public believes in unions, but the deck is so stacked against them. By the, and that's why the PRO Act matters so much and it's why Democrats really are fighting for the PRO Act and Republicans are blocked it. McConnell is absolutely using the filibuster blocks it over and over and over again. So it's clear that Democrats are still the party of unions and the party of workers. It's just we don't, we, we the, the, the public is less convinced of that. I mean, I think the public thinks, many, many workers think that neither party is on their side. Uh, and uh, Bill Clinton once said to a group of us, he said, if I can remember this right, he said, he said, the, the voters don't, working class voters don't think um, either party will do anything for them, but they vote Republican because they think the Democrats will do something to them. It might be take their guns, it might mean force their daughters to have an abortion. I mean, it might be those kinds of things, but that's why our economic message 
I mean, I, I, I have, I've been, I've got an F from the NRA my whole career. I've been for marriage equality 30 years. I've been pro-choice my whole life, my whole adult life when I kind of knew what it was. And, and I win in elections. I don't, I, I win in spite of those issues in Ohio. And I know that there are a lot of people that a lot of workers are just, but because I keep the focus on always on justice, I never back away from point of guns or choice or civil or human rights in any way ever and won't. But if you keep talking the economy, because look, I mean, look, look where, look what Dr. King was doing when he was assassinated. He was fighting. He understood. He understood how worker rights and civil rights come together. Who was he? Whom was he fighting for? He was fighting for the most exploited workers, perhaps in America, sanitation workers. Two of them had been killed, both black men, by a garbage compactor the week before. I think his first trip to Memphis. I'm not sure of the timing. But he understood that that fighting for workers and fighting for civil rights were essentially the same thing. And that message, loud and clear, doesn't just win elections. It gives us the path and the, the, um, the, the recipe on, on how to govern. And that, that, that commands a huge majority in this country. One last question for you, Senator, and, and also for, for you, Farah, which is, is what, how can we, what's it going to take or how can we revive American manufacturing? And should that be a priority of the federal government uh, moving forward? And, and, and if we can, what does it mean to do that? Yeah. Um, well, I think we're starting to have uh, policies that look at that and prioritize that. In the past, we've uh, only looked at Americans as consumers. And so it, it didn't matter whether they lost their jobs, all that mattered was the price of their television set. And being able to consume low cost goods was all that anybody thought about. And so I, I think the conversation is shifting towards citizens need jobs. Biden talks about jobs a lot. Uh, not every Democrat does, but we need to do more of that because jobs are more than a paycheck. Jobs are, um, their uh, social networks, their self-esteem. Um, you know, the one of the steel workers I followed was a woman who was able to leave an abusive man because of a job in the factory. To her, that's what women's rights were, uh, getting uh, that job in the factory that had previously no woman had ever done before. Uh, so I just think we need to um, get back to what these things really mean to blue collar people. And even just having an understanding of this in Washington um, that's not uh, heavily siloed. Um, civil rights is about jobs, factory jobs being available to everyone. We, we fought a civil rights movement so that black people could have equal access to jobs in those factories. And 15 years later, those factories started moving away. Um, so I think even just shifting the conversation towards the importance of jobs, the psychic importance of jobs, um, can matter a lot. Um, I mean, we can go we can go on about whether the future factories are going to employ as many people, and uh, but I, I think just start having as a starting point the fact that blue colored people want to work and they don't want to live off a, a check that comes in the mail from the government. Um, that's not, uh, I think that's not what gives them dignity, according to the steel workers that I've followed. Um, I think just starting with that uh, would make a difference. I, I fully concur. I, I think she kind of, um, Ms. Stockman kind of, she didn't really dance around it, but she she showed, well, I was, I was going to say she, she may have danced a bit around the, the, just right now, the term dignity of work. I, it's a term that I use often. It's a term that um, Pope Leo, the labor Pope, I'm, I'm Lutheran, not Catholic, but I, I, I love Pope Leo because he, he really is the first major figure in the world that talked about the dignity of work in, in so many Latin words. Uh, Dr. King sort of popularized the term dignity of work. Um, and Ms. Stockman in her book showed so very well how these jobs give dignity to people. Um, they give dig, they, they, I, I went to uh, Johnny Appleseed Junior High and Mansfield Senior High School in Mansfield, Ohio, um, with most of my classmates, their parents carried union cards. 
and they could send their kids to Ohio State, um, some even to a private school like Denison or Wesleyan or Hiram. Um, they could, they, some of the kids knew they would end up in fact, good paying union factory jobs. Some of them wanted to be tradespeople, but it had a certain dignity to, the, to it that I think policymakers don't think, they think, well, somebody's got to have those factory jobs. Well, the fact is, if, if you're making a decent wage, and particularly if you believe in your union, you're part of something bigger than you, which is what trade union movement's all about, um, you, then, you then have a certain dignity and a pride of work that really is good for families and communities. And I think Ms. Stockman's interviews really went to that centrally and how important that is. And, and I, I, would, I would add about um, what you said, Ms. McCarthy, about manufacturing, what's gonna happen. I, uh, this this um, most recent bill we were working on, uh, biggest victory with, for Buy America and the infrastructure bill we've ever had. So you're, you're, you're building the Brent Spence Bridge in Cincinnati, which carries 3% of GDP back and forth of the Ohio River every day. Um, you build, build it with American steel. Uh, made made by American workers. You, uh, we we we're working on something. Pardon the acronym, USICA, which will um, help to restore competitiveness with China. Understand, all many of these supply chain problems are because U.S. companies lobbied their Congress on trade and tax policy so they could move jobs overseas, make more money, sell those products back to the United States, making the supply chain who knows where and much harder to put it back together when we really need to rebuild like we do after in the midst and after the pandemic. So um, we gain by this, this new manufacturing policy. As, as Ms. Stockman said, there won't, there won't be the Westinghouse plant of 7,000 in Mansfield, Ohio. Again, they will not be that big, but there's simply no reason we can't continue to make things in this country and do better than we have with a partnership with the federal government. Not, not a bunch of subsidies, but more of a partnership on training and investment and all that, that we knew how to do as a nation that we've sort of forgotten about. All right, welcome back everyone. And uh, thank you, that was, that was a great conversation. I wanna pick up on the, on the theme that, that you and the Senator were talking about fair, um, on that last question, which is, which is again about, about the workers and, and their sense of pride and dignity in their work. I mean, a theme that comes through loud and clear in the book is, is that these workers do take a lot of pride in their work and the, and the quality of the bearings that they produce uh, in their specialized knowledge or uh, about how to make that equipment work. I mean, um, Shannon and the, and the furnaces, you know, um, she really uh, cares deeply uh, and, and knows a lot about how to make complicated equipment work. Um, and also a lot of pride in their shared history. Uh, um, and it also comes through really clearly uh, that these are workers who want to be treated with respect and dignity. And that becomes a big point of contention when the company expects them to, first of all, pack up their plant to ship to Mexico and, and then train their replacements. Um, can you just walk us through a little bit, you know, and, and help us understand just the emotional journey that, that these workers go through uh, as part of this process and, and what you took away from it? Yeah. So in the beginning, I was I was really following them as they agonized over whether they were going to train their replacements. And this was sort of a, a, like a microcosm of American politics at that moment, because their plant was moving to Mexico. They were angry and they had to decide, are they going to train their replacement for like an extra four dollars an hour of, of a bonus or are they going to refuse and try to fight and keep the plant there? which is what the union tried to do. So John Feltner, who was the union vice president, went through the whole plant saying, nobody train, nobody train. If they can't, if, 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 we, if we can stop the trainings, then they can't move the plant. Because guess what? The guys in the suits with the college degrees, they don't know how to operate these machines. They don't know how to build a bearing, right? So this was his, uh, this was his idea. Um, the, a lot of the black workers said, hmm, you know what? We're not going to stop this thing from happening. We might as well get the bonus. So they, a lot of them raised their hand unapologetically. And in the back of their mind, a lot of them thought, hey, we remember when it was not so long ago that you didn't want to train us. You didn't want to train our dads and our, our uncles and our granddads. And so there was that element of you know, not refusal to train the Mexicans was racist. 
And so that was an interesting element. Um, Shannon as well, she, uh, she agonized over it and she ultimately raised her hand. She remembered how horrible uh, it was to try to get trained as a heat treat operator. In the beginning, she was told heat treat is not for a woman. Heat treat is not for a woman. So, um, you know, there was there were different opinions, uh, differences of opinion and, and friendships were torn apart uh, by this sort of agonizing over what to do when the Mexican trainees came into the plant. And um, I went to Mexico and interviewed the Mexican trainees as well about their experiences. And a lot of them surprisingly felt incredible sympathy for their, uh, for the Americans, even the Americans who had uh, rejected them. They remember being holed up in this office while the steel workers outside were hosting a rally and it was considered too dangerous for them to leave the plant, walk through the phalanx of, of, of rallying steel workers. So they stayed there and just listened to the chanting, keep it made in America and the honking of cars passing by. And so, you know, a lot of them, the, the, the two Mexican uh, trainees that I really talked to, both of them left the company within six months after that, because they said, we see this company is throwing away its workers and they're going to throw us away too. And so, you know, there was a sense of, Workers get screwed no matter what, and 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 so that was really um, that was really uh, hit hard uh, for me. Yeah, I have to say when I it was the first time I'd ever read a book where again the 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 impact on the workers who are inheriting the jobs and just the the complexity of that for them and and you know and and just the the way that you are able to sort of sort of um, Describe this sort of pitting of workers against each other and, and, and their awareness of that. It was really, really amazing. Uh, I thought it was a real highlight in the book. Um, um, so, you know, throughout the book, Prairie, you're very open and honest about how your life and your social, your social circles, pardon me, uh, look a lot different from the people you're writing about um, and how those different backgrounds contributed to very different worldviews. Um, as you went into writing the book. So can you talk about what it was like to write from the from the vantage point, from your vantage point, you know, of, of being a lead educated, um, um, working for the media? Um, and did this process make you think uh, about your life differently since writing the book? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just I, a little bit about me. My mother grew up as a Black woman in Jim Crow, Mississippi. And uh, she got a PhD and was a professor. My father, uh, a white man from Pennsylvania, he wasn't from any great means. Um, he considered himself middle class when he was growing up, but he's probably lower middle class. They didn't have a ton of money. And yet he was able to get a PhD. And so I was a child of two PhDs. I went to Harvard and at Harvard, I felt, I felt poor. I worked in the dining hall, right, two or three days a week to, to make money to cover my bills and stuff like that. I felt like, oh, I'm because who am I comparing myself to? All the rich kids I'm going to school with who don't have to work in the dining hall and who have computers in their rooms and, and all the stuff I didn't have. But the reality is anybody with a college degree at, a, at an elite university or really any university in this country is immensely privileged. Education is an immense privilege in, in our country. And the, the economy is really designed for people with college degrees. And yet we make up a third of the adults in this country, only a third. That was the most shocking thing I learned in this whole process was that two thirds of American adults don't have a four year college degree. Um, uh, and it was, you know, there's a lot of resentment uh, around that for workers, the feeling that their knowledge was considered less important because nobody had certified it, right? So workers training each other on the factory floor, they mastered skills, they mastered machines that I, I'm, I'm not sure I could have done Shannon's job. But because no university or training program had come through and certified what Shannon knew, you know, it, what, she couldn't take it with her. 
it was hard to take it with her. And the kind of jobs that she could get as an expert in heat treat, you know, were jobs that she thought were a dying breed job. Like, you know, she was, everybody who walked out of that plant was afraid that the next job they were going to get, if it was in a factory, was also going to close down. There, it was like the, you know, the rug being pulled under you, out from under you. And so there's not a lot of appetite for, for factory jobs right now, because people think it's a dying, it's, it's a dying thing. Um, so I, I came to really see that even though it's normal in my circle to have law degree or a PhD, it's normal. I, I, I interact with almost no one on my daily, on a daily basis that has no co college degree. And yet, um, that's the majority of the country. So for people who are listening, who are decision makers, who make, you know, make decisions about the country, you have to think about the majority of the country and they're not like you. They're not like, they're not like us. It, 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 their economic reality is different. And, it, and, it, and it's not to say they shouldn't be like us. The, the answer is, is not everyone go out and get a college degree. Because then what you have is education inflation. You have people who are baristas with college degrees, right? Like now these days you need a college degree to stand behind the counter at a, at a Hertz, you know, rent a car. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think that's the answer is to make everyone just like us, but we need a better understanding. We need to restore the connection between working people and, and, and the decision makers. Thank you for that. And uh, I, I do want to, this is such an excellent conversation. I know lots of questions keep popping up in my head. And I just want to encourage to everyone who's listening that um, please tee up your questions in the queue. We are going to have a, a, a period of, of question and answer uh, with Farah. And she, I know she'd love to hear your questions. Um, while you're doing that, I, I am going to just ask a quick follow up question to that. Um, you know, again, the fact that the education, the educational divide is, is such an important one. And sometimes I think uh, misunderstood one, uh, particularly among among college educated and 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 much of the media, um, I think is something you know a lot of people are grappling with. I, I wanted to ask you too. I, I think a lot of people, um, you know, we're sort of seeing conversations between which, which are more divisive, race or class, and I hate to pit them against one another because of course they're both very divisive. But I wanted to ask you whether or not you were surprised at all by how race figured into some of the relationships among your workers and and you know its salience. I mean, uh, one of the workers that you profiled, uh, Wally, is African American, and the other two are white. Um, and again, they all share not having gone to college and, and working in a factory, but then they are, they do straddle this other, you know, very uh, stark divide uh, in the United States. Just wondering any insights or any surprises for you um, in that. You do talk about that in the book. Yeah. Um, I was surprised by the extent to which the white uh, workers had good friendships with their black coworkers and yet were unaware of how their black coworkers felt about basic things. <laughs> um, there, you know, they had really uh, close friendships. They had a bowling team. They went to Colts games together. They ate dinner at each other's houses a lot. They were in the same union fighting for each other's jobs. And yet, when it came to race, they didn't have a lot of deep conversations with each other about how they felt. It was kind of a, it was a taboo subject. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of white workers were like, oh, I don't want to step on that landmine, you know, and, you know, they'd learned that things could blow up if you talk about race, so don't talk about race. And so they were, um, unaware of you know they were not privy to a lot of the conversations i was hearing when i talked to black workers about why they didn't like donald trump or why you know why they or the fact that they felt it was racist not to train mexicans like you know these were not sort of conversations that they were having with each other very often or in a deep way um i, I that was kind of surprising but i i do want to say that the sort of, I kind of got a different sweep of history when I looked at, you know, you, when I looked at these workers and you can see that we got a middle class in this country because of a labor movement that made jobs, factory jobs like that, middle-class jobs. 
nobody gave them those those middle class wages or safety or or vacations or healthcare. They they weren't given that. They fought for that, and and yet, you know, in the '60s, only white men really had those jobs right? Pretty much. Pretty much uh, white men were the ones who dominated in those, in those good paying union jobs. And then you had a, you know, the civil rights movement got, got uh, black workers and women the right to any job on the factory floor, theoretically, right? That's what, it, you know, you couldn't discriminate on the basis of race or sex. That's what we got with the Civil Rights Act. And then the, and then the factories started moving. And so, you know, these are intertwined struggles. And it's not to say that every worker, you know, if you're if you're a black woman working in these factories, you're gonna have, you know, that's what intersectionality is all about. You're gonna have more struggles. But but I think um, the fact remains that these workers had much more in common with each other than they did with the CEO. And so who's in who's who's benefiting in the end of the day when we focus um, when we focus solely on race and to the exclusion of class, like who does that help? Um, so I mean, I just think I think we have to we have to see them as in sort of interlocking interlocking struggles. And you know, the, too often I hear, oh, those workers are whiny, privileged, entitled, you know, white men who just want um, they feel entitled to jobs that they they don't really deserve, and it's. You know, I'd, I'm not sure that that those arguments being made by college educated people who are doing pretty well, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that rings true or that that helps us get to a better place. So we have gotten some questions from the audience. Uh, so thank you. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and tee one of those up right now. Uh, this is a question from Laura. And she's asking what kind of social support services were available to the workers you followed? And, and from your perspective, what ideally would be in place to help these workers get through something like a plant closure? Um, so number one, universal health care. <laughs> the one thing that, you know, healthcare came out big in the book. All, the three people I followed, it was a huge, um, it, it impacted them a lot. They all tried to buy it after they left and found it unaffordable. Even with Obamacare, they found it unaffordable. Um, and and um, just the way it was set up, it was really hard for them to get it, um, uh, to get it at a, at a price that they could, that they found uh, affordable. Um, un, uh, unemployment insurance was something that really helped, even though it was taxed and it was, it was not a ton of money that that helped and it was something they didn't feel ashamed to collect i went with john to um you know i watched john go through sort of run the gauntlet of collecting unemployment insurance and he said look this is a system i paid into all my life so i don't i don't feel shame collecting this check but if it were welfare he a system he hadn't paid into he would have uh, you know, rather walk through fire or done, you know, he, he would have, he would never have wanted to collect from, from something called welfare or deemed that he deemed welfare. And so, um, I, you know, there, there is a whole program called TAA, which is trade, uh, trade adjustment assistance act. Um, it's, it's, it's aimed at workers who lose their jobs because of trade. It's supposed to retrain them but there's a ton of hoops so that they have to jump through. They have to get approval for the classes. The classes aren't always um, nearby. There's a lot of reasons why some of the workers I talked to just all they wanted was another job. They didn't want to go jump through government hoops. Um, I didn't know all that many people who ended up getting uh, retrained through that. And studies of TAA retraining aren't great. Uh, don't uh, lead us to believe that that those workers do better. Um, in fact, studies show that they're actually earning less people who went through that training than had they just gone out and gotten another job, which is a kind of discouraging fact. We don't do a good job of that. And these are particular workers. They're in their 50s. You know, they're people who are, you know, they're too young to retire, but they're kind of too old to go back to school in a way. And so this is a particular kind of uh, problem. 
Yeah, and that was one of the other questions that we got, Farah, from Greg. Was it was about you know, did you observe any effective retraining for workers where, where positions were lost, and and did it lead to long lasting uh, work opportunities in the same geographical area? And it, it sounds like you did not, but I don't know if there's anything more you wanted to share on that. Well, I should say that. Um... There were some workers who got on at a plant run by Eli Lilly making medicine, and those workers uh, seemed to do just as well, if not better, as they had been. And that's because they were making migraine shots that cost $900 a pop. So again, healthcare. If you're in the healthcare industry, you were doing pretty well. And healthcare in Indianapolis was like the third best industry you could be in if you were a blue collar person. And some people told me healthcare is the new factory. It's the new thing you can do to earn a middle-class wage without a college degree, without a four-year college degree. And so a lot of people flocked into the healthcare fields. Um, you know, the trouble is just that it's it's an industry that's based on, you know, uh, insurance. And this is the reason we, we're all being dragged down by the anchor of healthcare costs, increasing healthcare costs is that it's now it's such a big part of our economy. And there's so many lobbying for those, you know, increasing costs, because you're paying all these salaries of people who are in that industry. Yeah, there's one where uh, John also ends up in a hospital, doesn't he? Yeah, which, which brings me to the to the next question: is is have you been have you stayed in touch with John, uh, Shannon and John and with with Wally's family? And and can you give us any updates on how they're doing today? Yeah, John was in a so John agonized uh, over whether he should get a, another job as a steel worker, which he could have done, and that you know I thought he would do that because that was such a huge part of his identity. But he decided to work maintenance at a spoiler alert, everyone uh, at a hospital, um, because uh, he thought, OK, nobody's going to tell all those doctors that this hospital is just closing down. Right. He was like, I want to be in the same boat as those rich doctors because they get taken care of and, and their thing is going to last long. Um, so that was his even though he, he took about a 20 percent pay cut. Um, and but he thought this is a job I can do in the future and this is something that isn't going away. Um, he recently got in a big bad motorcycle crash and almost died. But he is <laughs> he's 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 okay and he's he's you know he's recovering. Um, Shannon, uh, I've kept in touch with her and she's her life is still uh, a, tumultuous but she's she's gotten another job at a factory she's making popcorn now <laughs> and it's really funny because I almost put it in the book um she thought about uh going for an interview in the very beginning right when she got laid off and this at this popcorn plant and they sent her the mission statement and she read it and it was you know she considered it so corny that she couldn't um, no pun intended, that she couldn't uh, imagine working there. So she didn't really go through with the interview. And now after years, she's there and and seems to really like it. So we'll see. And I'm glad I didn't ruin her chances of getting hired there by uh, bad mouthing it. And it's corny mission statement in my book. Great. Okay. And um, we, we did get a question in the chat, uh, Farah, I think sort of asking, you know, kind of pushing back a little bit on the, on the union question. And, and was it so, so essentially, was there not a time when unions became so strong that, that the productivity and quality of products declined because of the power they had? Did you ever get a sense of that, 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 that there was a certain sense of like, well, this is happening because we overreached or we got too loaded so or anything like that? A lot of things that a lot of things that unions fight for are things like shift shift change you know i want i want to keep my shift i want seniority i don't they they fight against flexibility and um uh, i this wasn't rexnord but another plan um uh, that i wrote about in west virginia recently that was also steel workers they voted down a contract because the company wanted to change from three shifts or to two or, you know, and they voted it down, no. And, and then the company decided, all right, we're out of here. We're moving to India. And so there is a sense that um, uh, workers see the world as labor and capital. And that is, that's the primary fight 
of, of that's how these union uh, reps were trained. But when globalization came around, there was a you know a new element to that where the capital could then take the factory elsewhere, right? And 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 instead, you know, the people who own those factories said, "You need to get in, get with us, get on our team, right? If you want to keep these factories here in the United States, you have to stop opposing us as if it's this, you know, endless fight between labor and capital. This is America versus other places, and if you want to keep this here, you got to get on board." And that was kind of the Trump message. It was like, "Yeah, you fought for environmental rights and minimum wages and OSHA and EEOC." But um, now the now the factories are are sidestepping all of those things that you got, and moving overseas. So if you want to bring the factories back, cool, let's do that. But you're not going to get those things. Get rid of the environmental standards. Get rid of the minimum wage. Get rid of healthcare. Stop you know stop piling all this stuff on companies. That was the deal Trump was giving workers. You, you we'll bring them we'll bring the that's that's the deal he offered them i don't say he gave it but let's get rid of all of that stuff that made it expensive to have a plant in the united states and we'll have your job you might earn ten dollars an hour instead of 25 but it'll be here and that was kind of the deal that he was he was he was offering them and and they were taking it they were willing to take it and so that just tells you about the centrality of jobs and the hunger to be a part of the American economy and to still be of use. So I do think that there, you know, a, a, a last point I'll say about this is that a lot of these unions are run by small groups of people. And it's, it's a pretty thankless job to be a union rep. But like, you know, the members pay their dues and they don't often go to the meetings. And so a lot of unions can be hollow and they, you know, the workers aren't really connected to what the fight is. And, and so um, it can it can be it can feel like an insular group are, are, are fighting for themselves instead of instead of everybody. There were a lot of workers after Rex Nord um, announced the closure. There were a lot of workers who said, let's take the 30 percent pay cut. Let's take it. Let's just let's do whatever we have to do to keep our jobs here. And that was not what the union was was trying to say. That's great. Uh, thank you for that. And um, so we are at almost three o'clock. I just want to sort of give you the last word, Fair. Is there anything, you know, again, uh, for people who are reading your book, particularly young people, you know, and, 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 and policymakers, any sort of final takeaways that you'd really want them to to take from the book? Any, any lessons or insights? I, I guess I just, um, you know, I spent most of my career um, focused on foreign affairs. Uh, I started my career in, in Kenya, working with street children. I, I had, you know, most of my attention was on uh, poverty in other parts of the world. And um, so this was the first time at the age of 42 that I started looking at the needs of, of Americans and how they are not being met. And I found that there are a lot of places that really need our help and, and they need our understanding. And, they, and we should look to them with the same amount of, of sympathy and attempt to understand them as we would people in another culture. Um, I, and I think, um, I think if we're willing to do that, um, there is a hope that we can start to devise some solutions to some of the problems that I was seeing. Well. On that note, then, Farrah, we'll wrap up. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this fantastic book. And I encourage everyone, um, you know, if you haven't read it yet, please do. It's really fantastic. And uh, this recording, too, of this conversation um, will be live on our website in about 24 or 48 hours, and we'll be sending out the links to folks. But um, thanks so much. This was a great conversation. Really appreciate your time and, uh, and, and look forward to your next book. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much for having me. Take care. Bye-bye.